Today's Tales from a Gemini is with Neil Morrison. Neil Morrison is an uh, editor, writer with the uh, On Track Off Road magazine. And Neil is my buddy. He's hilarious. He's funny. And he knows his Moto GP. We talk about the season opener. This was done the day before uh, the Qatar GP. And he did me a favor, man. He rushed to, uh, to get this done. And we have a ball. We laugh. Uh, we talk about the, the riders, the controversies, and if you like GP, this will be, I think you'll like this interview and, you, and you'll get a couple of yuck yucks in. So enjoy my conversation with Mr. Neil Morrison. It never gets old, Wyatt. It never gets old, bro. I love, that's when I know it's time. It's like the kickoff to a, to a football game. One, two, three. Hey, it's BT with Tales from a Gemini. Man, I'm so excited. And I feel bad at the same time because this next guy, oh, you've had, well, I had him on before. And I, you know, when the start of the season, man, I just, I live for MotoGP. I live for it. I mean, it's like the, the, the moments after the last race of the season and before the first race, I'm just jonesing. Well, I'll take it back. It's such a long season that, like, the first month, I kind of don't miss it. But after that, I jones. So we're on the eve. We're literally on the eve of the first race. And I asked this, this next guy, I said, just please talk to me. Please talk to me about MotoGP. No one loves MotoGP like I love MotoGP. You go, okay, I will go. But I got a dinner party I got to go to. There's not going to be any alcohol because we're in this, you know, country we're here. Not, not going to be any alcohol, so I'll do it. And, man, he got, you know, he, he was late, but I feel bad he was late because I'm just needling him. Just please come on the show and let's talk. So it's my guest, Mr. Neil Morrison. And I got one thing to say to you, Neil Morrison. You like dogs, big guy? <laughs> you like dogs? You like I dogs. like dogs. <laughs> I love dogs. <laughs> Hey, man, you've been working on your accent since the last time I spoke to you. It's pretty <laughs> well, good. That's when, pretty good. When I saw Belfast, I saw Belfast. It was a great movie. Did you see it? Uh, I haven't seen it yet. I'm, a, I'm ashamed to say. Yeah, man. I, uh, I got COVID uh, recently, and that sort of upset my kind of cinema-going rhythm. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, I still haven't seen it. But Dude, why, why, it, it, It's like me not seeing Roots. Why didn't you see Belfast? <laughs> <laughs> it's not for a... Uh, uh, it's not for a lack of uh, a lack of wanting to go. It's just uh, sort of yeah, circumstances have gotten in the way. Unfortunately, I'll be going once I get back from Qatar. I'll be going. But I remember I texted you and said, I mean, you texted me and I said you got to see Belfast. Remember that was when it first came out, so you have no excuse, buddy. Remember, and then you told me to go see uh, uh, some of the dog, Power of the Dog. You told me to go oh, see yeah. Power of the Dog, and I did it because of you. So see, when you tell me to do something, I do it. But apparently. <laughs> Apparently, it didn't work. It's not reciprocated. <laughs> you know, my, my parents both went to see it. They said they cried at the end. A couple of friends went to see it. They said they cried at the end. So I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to be uh, quite, emo quite, uh, Dude, quite emotional. So Let me tell you something, man. Honestly, at the very end, I don't want to ruin it. God, I mean, that whole movie, I'm watching it, man. And, it's, and I equate it on my, if you see my movie review. I equated that to the white boys in the hood. Because that's the way basically it was, at least the way I interpreted it. Instead of having rap music or soul music, they had Van Morrison, who was blue-eyed soul, mm. basically. And mm. the music came in at the perfect part. And it was just, and, it, and instead of the, the styles, uh, instead of like Lawrence Fishburne's character, the woman was a strong, uh, was the strongest uh, one in the family. She's the one that ran the family while he was in England. She had to run the family. And she was, I mean, you could relate. I don't care what race you are, whatever, you could relate to that. She's keeping that kid in line. You know, he got caught stealing something. She goes, you're going down to the store and you're going to apologize to him. And I mean, it just, man, I, I'm telling you, man, I'm watching this movie. And it is cinema. Kenneth Branagh never goes wrong. Kenneth Branagh is one of the gems of cinema, bro. And he really, I love that man more than anything, man. Kenneth, Kenneth Branagh doesn't get the credit he deserves. Great actor, great director. And from the moment it started, I go, this is going to be great. You just know greatness when you see it. Right, right. Yeah. No, it, and it's, uh, I mean, it's set in a, a pretty uh, tumultuous time in history. Um, and one, I guess, that maybe parts of the world don't really know much about, but is, is quite crazy. And, you know, to think my parents lived through that era and kind of got through it and are so blasé when they talk about it. Um, you know, when I, when I try and pry and ask them a bit more about how they lived through Belfast in those years, they're very, uh, you know, it's just as if it was like a, an everyday event, like, oh, you know, yeah, nothing, nothing crazy. We just dealt with it. I'm like, uh, you were kind of living through some crazy stuff, guys. Like, you know, I'm sure it was not just a, a, a sort of, uh, situation that you just described, you know, but um, yeah, no, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing it, man. Looking forward to seeing it. You know, your, your movie reviews, actually, um, I think, because in Spain, I, where I live, uh, movies come out a little bit later, usually one or two months later than in America. Uh, 
Uh -huh. So whenever I read about a film that's really good, get lots of good reviews on the festival circuit, then I see one of your reviews that's picking it up. I'm like, okay, I, I have to see that. Oh, well, so, thank uh, you, brother. Thank you. I figured, like I said, a minute of me is about is enough uh, for, for people can stand. About a minute of me is like perfect. So what I like to give you is, you know, make it try to make it funny, entertaining, but don't tell you too much about the movie. Just enough where you go, okay. And don't tell you just specific parts. Because I hate going to see a movie and see the trailer and you go, well, basically I've seen the movie now. You know what I mean? Right. It's like they, they give everything away, basically. So if I can just give you just enough and make entertaining that uh, thing. And, and now it's, it's kicking ass on TikTok. I got like almost 7,000 viewers on TikTok. Oh, fantastic, man. So people right. trust me, man. But it's weird yeah. how – now, are you – you're Irish or what are you? I'm Northern Irish. So I, came, I come from Northern Ireland. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, but my – yeah. I mean, yeah, I come from Northern Ireland. Um, are you sure? I don't sound so sure. <laughs> I know you're like. Yeah. I think I'm from Northern Ireland. <laughs> what do you, what do you, why you look up to? Yeah. You look like, like a woman who's who's get, gets called lying. Where are you at? Jennifer, no, you're lying. You know, I ask you, and you hesitated on where you're from. And you've been drinking, Neil. <laughs> yeah, you know, like people always ask, like, so where do your allegiances lie? Do they lie with Ireland? Do they lie with the UK? And I'm like, well, I guess it's kind of just in the middle, really. I mean, Northern Irish. I'm not from the Ireland of the UK, but I guess if my allegiances lay anywhere, it'd probably be with Ireland. I mean, yeah, it would definitely be with Ireland. Um, um, I, I find that, honestly, I find that fascinating. Only because, like, you know, we're in the United States. We, we only care about ourselves. I mean, that's just the truth. That's why we're like... What do you guys do? I mean, we're stupid over here. So we're, we're only like, we're very, you know, United States, USA, you know, whatever. And we never understand anybody else's conflict. So that always intrigued me in the sense of like, I had no idea. I didn't understand. Even growing up, I didn't understand why they did what they did, you know? So that's why I would love to talk to you more at length about it. I mean, Simon Patterson tried to school me on it and he did, he did a little bit. And I was like, wow. So I respect that. I respect the game. Trust me on what they do. And, and, and it also taught me to, you know, shut the fuck up when it comes to stuff like I don't understand. You know what I mean? Like, when you, <laughs> and honestly, when it comes to that, and I don't know, I'm just going to be quiet and just watch. Because I, I know that there's some, there's some heavy tensions there. So I'll just be quiet. and, and, and just, you know, <laughs> I like to learn, though, you know. So we'll talk about that. Yeah. With that. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a long, uh, a long, complicated story for sure. And, uh, yeah, I think both kind of sides – might look back at some things and think, yeah, that was that was pretty terrible. Um, and I don't think, you know, either side came away looking particularly good, you know. And I think the people in Northern Ireland are are well aware of that and uh, quite, I think, wary of any kind of return, you know. Occasionally you'll hear some sort of thing about maybe there's some small paramilitary group that are picking up weapons or they've they've planted like a bomb underneath a policeman's car and it's pretty united the the reaction to that you know like people are just like no we lived through this everything has been relatively much much better since uh since the kind of good friday agreement which happened in 1998 um and we don't want to go back to it so yeah yeah, why would you? And now you see what's going on with, you know, the Ukraine and Russia. It's like, man, I mean, I think Mark has said it best. He's like, I can't believe 2022 and we're doing this shit. Like, I mean, if anything, from what we went through in the summer here in the United States with the Black Lives Matter and everything else, why would you want to just destroy your fellow man? And then, and then with Russia, when they did that to Ukraine, it's like, haven't we learned anything? I just, I just, I think the people on the street are just wanting to be more peace. And it's always the people up high who are on a power trip or whatever. And it's just like, and it just sucks because all we want to do is, I don't know about you, all I want to do is, I feel like the black Jeff, Jeff Spicoli. All I want to do is, you know, drink some Starbucks, watch MotoGP, <laughs> and maybe some F1. You know what I mean? And that's all I want to do, man. And ride my motorcycle and motocross. And that's all I want to do. And then you have to deal with this shit and watch people die. That's not what I want to do. That's not what the world's about. You're supposed to enjoy yourself. You know what I mean? Yeah, man. I mean, yeah. If only it was. If only it was that simple, you know. Um, I wish it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how you but feeling, I know man? It's... How you feeling now? With the, you had, you had said you, when did you had COVID. When's the last time you had COVID? Uh, so it was around the time of the Malaysia test. So that was the start of February. Um, is, it, is that your first bout with COVID? It was, yeah. But it wasn't so bad. Oh, you, you had it twice, right? Dude, I, I, I still can't breathe. I went, I went and cycled today. 
I have a hard time breathing, but you know, being the great professional athlete that I am in my mind, I just I, I went through it, you know, and I was yeah, I, I, I feel like I'm the black uh, Peter Sagan, and so that's what I keep doing. I would go through sprints. I would like okay, I'd say the the uh, the I see the speed limit sign or whatever, and I would sprint to that, you know, ten second sprints, and kept doing that, and I couldn't breathe. But I go, you know what? If I die, I'm gonna die like I'm gonna die like Sagan, you know. <laughs> so that's what I do, man. That's what gets me through. So yeah, I thought about that. So you're a cyclist too, aren't you? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say in any way kind of professional, but I, I love cycling. That's kind of my, yeah, high, that's my kind of therapy after race weekends when I'm trying to de-stress and get my mind in order. Yeah. Road or, or mountain biking? Uh, roads, road biking, yeah. What kind yeah, of bike you got? I, I got, uh, I think it's, a, it's a, a bike factory in Brooklyn um, called a Kona. Do you know uh, anything, Neil? I'm asking you questions. They're pretty, you're man. You're stuttering. You're just like, I don't know. Well, what is it, Neil? I mean, what kind of journalist? And like, where are you from? Uh, Northern Ireland? <laughs> what kind of bike? Uh, I, think it's a, I think it's from <laughs> What do you know? <laughs> I, I ask myself that daily, BT. You know, I just not really sure about anything at the moment, you know? That's what, that's what happens. Car, when... We can pull over by the cops. I'm like, oh, God, he's going to get me arrested. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know this gentleman? Ah, yeah. uh, I don't know. <laughs> do you feel safe, sir? Uh, <laughs> Maybe. Kind of. <laughs> if you come to Texas and we're in a car together and we get pulled over, I'm going to jail just because you hesitate. <laughs> yeah, it's, cops like, this guy's high as hell. Yeah. Get him in the back of the fucking meat wagon. <laughs> this guy's high, but I'm sure the black guy probably kidnapped him. So he's going to jail. Are you going to be okay, sir? <laughs> Hey, welcome to America. But anyway, listen, the season has started. I mean, honestly, and I, this is why I wanted to talk about this season. And I'm, I know I'm not the first to say this, but man, I just feel that this is going to be the greatest season in MotoGP history. You have uh, how many bikes on the grid? 24? Yes. 24 bikes, 21 rounds this year. And you're going to have, honestly, maybe world champions who don't get a point. And they'll finish a race and not get a point. It's kind of scary, isn't it? Um, yeah, Luca Marini, uh, Valentino's half-brother, was talking at the end of testing, and he said there isn't one uncompetitive bike in the grid anymore. Um, that's 24 bikes that can basically, on the, any given day, be running up towards the front which is quite a crazy prospect i mean yeah i don't think MotoGP has ever been at a level quite like this where the consistency right the way down through the field is as strong as it is um so yeah you have to say that it's going to be i mean it's going to be close uh, it's going to be competitive um and i think yeah we're in for a pretty amazing title fight like i, I don't see how how there isn't like three guys towards the end of the season fighting at the front of the championship so i mean everything points toward it being Pretty exciting, pretty fabulous. 21 of the 24 bikes at the Mandalika test were under a minute. You, I mean, that's uh, that's unfathomable. 21 of 24 under a, I mean, under a second of each other. That's ast. I mean, I I'm looking at that going, are you out of your mind? What this season <laughs> is going to be crazy, and everybody's going to be like, hey, where's Dan Bender? Where, where's Bender? <laughs> you know what I mean? Is he going to be that crazy? Is he going to be you think? <laughs> that crazy uh, on the track in MotoGP as he was in Moto3. And I didn't think he was that bad in Moto3. I just think that race, he got a bad rep. I mean, he was aggressive, but but you can't say he was any more aggressive than Jeremy Alcoba. Right, right. Yeah, I think you look back to 17, 2018, and uh, he was over the limit on a regular basis, I would say. Yeah. Uh, last year, I wouldn't say he was anywhere near the, the kind of the most aggressive rider on the grid. And I think, yeah, the fact that he made a mistake in such a crucial moment of the championship, obviously that was unfortunate. But um, yeah, I felt he copped a bit too much flack for that uh, particular incident in, in Portimao. You know, and I, I think he's he's made a concerted effort to change his ways. And he is very aware of the, the kind of public reputation of him, I think. And he's tried to basically iron out those rough edges that he had. So um, yeah, no, I, I like Binder. I think... You know, it's just a massive step, isn't it? You know, jumping up from Moto3 right into MotoGP. I mean, he's he's in the the snake pit, essentially. Um, he's on a year-old bike, uh, a bike that doesn't have too much top speed. So I'd say he's he's facing a pretty tough task this year. But, you know, he's a talented guy. Let's see how he does. Well, I mean, what is it about the Aussies? He's like only, what, it, you know, I think Miller, was Miller the last one to come from uh, Moto3 to yeah. MotoGP? 
Exactly. Yes. In 2015, I think that was. Yeah. And it, you know, it took him a good season, season and a half to work it out, to work it in himself in the right way, to train in the right way, you know. But that was, I think that was more him than the bike. I mean, I love Jack. I really did. I think Jack, Jack now, Jack now off the bike, he's about as close to Rossi as you can get now as far as off the bike. I mean, he's funny, but he's a little bit more direct, brash, but it's still funny. Like, it doesn't come off mean, but he's a good sound bite. You know, where Rossi was just, I don't think, you know, there'll never be another Rossi, obviously, but I think as far as off the bike, Miller's more like Rossi, but on the bike, he had to learn how to, to train and to win and to take it more seriously. I think he was more into partying and whatever, and he wasn't training right till I don't know who it was, pulled him to the side and said, hey, you got to get it together. Yeah, I think Jack would admit himself that uh, that first couple of months that he was a MotoGP rider, he didn't uh, treat it with uh, the professionalism that the situation merited. Um, I remember uh, a colleague being at his team launch that year and he was sitting, <laughs> by the end of the team launch, he was sitting at the bar getting drunk snogging someone and yeah you're like okay i want motorcycle races to be like that you know but it didn't quite convey the sort of professional air that all of these guys show right now you know <laughs> and i mean hey if you're a 20 if you're a 20 year old and you've just been handed a motor gp contract with honda I, mean, I think you're you're probably more than likely to feel that you've kind of made it in life and that situation deserves to be celebrated but i think the first couple of months miller was a bit he, I think he's admitted himself that he didn't quite uh, deal with it as, as professional as he should have done. And it wasn't until 16 when he started actually properly training and yeah. living the sport every day, you know, like you have to when you're when you're trying to become the best. Well, I, I it always, I, maybe because I came from, I was a frustrated athlete in the sense of I had to work that much harder just to be a little bit above average. I mean, I, I, could, I can't walk a straight line without tripping over my feet. And when you're wrestling, you know, that, <laughs> I try to intimidate people and walk on the mat. I actually tripped while I was walking on the mat one time, and I saw the guy's eyes like, really? Seriously? That's what I'm dealing with here? I mean, honestly, so I had to work that much harder just to be a little bit above average. So to me, if you're at that level and you're not taking it that serious, it, it, it just makes me angry because there's so many people who want to be there who, would, who are training and doing the right things, and maybe they don't have that natural talent that he does. Yeah, exactly. But I also look at it in another way. And you think back to how racing was in the 70s and 80s, and there was kind of more of a romance to it. You didn't have to train every single day away from the track. You didn't have to just focus on, you know, there was space there to have a good time. Um, you know, when the when the champagne had flowed in the podium, then you could go and have a good time away from the track. And I think it was last year, Joanne Mir said um, towards the end of the year that he he was just feeling burnt out. And I think he took like a week or two weeks away from training um, because he just felt like mentally fatigued. He wasn't getting good results. And he was just like, okay, I need to change up something on my schedule. And when he was explaining this, he said, even after he won the title in 2020, he said, yeah, sure. He went out, had a few drinks, got a bit Larry, had a little party. But by the Tuesday after that final race, he was back doing motocross regularly, training on flat track, just grinding. And you think, man, that doesn't sound like, I mean, you ride motorbikes all day. So, yeah, that's fun. But yeah. the sort of mental focus that you need, even after you've achieved this massive, incredible thing, and you're still like, okay, two days later, i got to get back into training. I mean, that, that's the sort of intensity that is, uh, well, I mean, to a, a man of my pursuits and a man of my persuasion, <laughs> it's just, I can't relate to that, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> well, what sport what did you do? What sport did you do growing up? Did you, well, a football, footballer? I wasn't a terribly sporty person, as you could probably imagine, BT. Hey, and hey, you never judge a book by its cover, Neil. If you, if you had told me you were a welterweight boxer, I'd be like, I, I can see it. You got that leg, and people it wouldn't take you serious, and you probably knock people out. You might be, yeah. you know, you might be <laughs> Neil the Nightmare. You know, you never know. You, you have a left, a left. You've been hook. watching that films. You've been watching that film Snatch too much. You know, not Irish people are like Brad Pitt's character. All right. <laughs> hey man, you never know. You never judge a book about. You never underestimate anybody. Take it for somebody who used to do sports. You never underestimate anybody. You take anybody down. I will. I will beat any six year old up. Any sixth grader. Any first grader. I don't take anybody lightly. I, I will do that. They talk back. They are gonna get smacked. That's, that's my philosophy, man. Seriously, you, don't, you, like you never know. You never know. So no, no sports like at all it. growing up. I mean, I played football uh, or soccer. Um, at a very mediocre level until I was about 15. And then I discovered alcohol and, <laughs> uh, you know, partying and, and chasing 
well, you know, just being a <laughs> silly a teenager, basically. <laughs> you have a girlfriend now. Is that why you said it like that? I do. Yeah. Yeah, I can tell because you, you has any any guy who has a girlfriend always hesitates about the the past life that he had fun in. He goes, then I was chasing, you know, it's a different life, BT. So <laughs> any guy who ever has a girlfriend and knows she might possibly see this, they always hesitate when they talk about their past life. I don't know why it is, because they'll still give you shit. Like, really? You still talk to that girl? That was over 10 years ago. Yeah, but you still talk to her, I bet, huh? I'm like, oh, here we go. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just how it is with women. Chasing incredibly unsuccessfully on my own. <laughs> yeah. Do you know that... Um, I, I was last on your show, I think it was around the end of 2020. Yes. And uh, you were very complimentary about my accent and my voice, I think, at one point. And you yes. might have might have mentioned that, that I don't know, you used some flowery term to uh, say the effect that my voice had on you. And a friend of mine, I guess he must have been quite bored one day, typed my name into YouTube and your show with me came on. Yes. And he, uh, yeah, basically that clip of you using a very flowery phrase to describe my voice <laughs> that was just like kind of being pinged around the WhatsApp groups between me and my friends for uh, weeks over Christmas. And yes. I was, yeah. so, I'm, so I'm famous in a little bit of, in a little circle. I mean, more than famous, more than famous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can go to Bangor, Northern Ireland any day and someone will buy you a beer. You know what? I don't really drink beer, but I just want to be, I'm going to go to Northern Ireland. I want to be like, I'm one of them. And they're like, hey, right. that's the fellow that interviewed Neil. And I'll be like, yes. <laughs> how great with that. I'll be like Braveheart going, <laughs> going into battle. <laughs> yeah. I look forward yeah, he, to it. I look forward he was, to it. He was Scottish, but you know. Yeah. Oh, oh, shit, yeah. Oh, same oh, thing, oh. same thing. Oh, no, 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 it's not. No, it's not. Don't, don't get me in trouble. I'm not going to say that. I'm not saying anything. I, I know. I, I can see a fight brewing. I got Scottish, Ireland, Northern Ireland, all that's all different. And Wales and all that. And Welsh, man, I'm not saying anything. I'm keeping my I'm, I'm keeping my trap shut. <laughs> I know how that works. I know how it works, man. I mean, it's like it's like here in the United States, north and south, and even in the south. You know, we from Alabama, we from Louisiana. Uh oh, you know. I mean, it's all it's all that same kind of. It's just it's like to me, it's it's all the same kind of ignorance. You know what I mean? I mean, right, right. what state is better than one other? You, you what? You're at thirty first in education. You're thirty second. I mean, you're still stupid. I mean, that's the way I look at it. <laughs> I mean, who can cast a stone here? That's the way I look at it. You know? Yeah. You say all states are equal, but we both know that Indiana is where you're from. No, that's where I live. Oh, that's, that's where you live. We, we all know that Indiana is the, it's the, it's the best one, right? <laughs> no, no, I told, I told my producer, I said, you know what? I said, listen, and I said, I will bag on Indiana, uh, uh, rightfully so, but also will give it credit. And I told him, I said, this is the best sports city in America because <clears throat> no one does sports like Indiana. I mean, I'm talking no matter what it is, if it's a Final Four, if it's a football game, basketball game, you, you once you come to downtown, you don't have to leave. And if you, and if you go to the track. It's maybe what a fifteen dollar ride on an Uber, maybe, maybe, and it's it's friendly enough, and everything's walking distance, good good hotels, or, or we're hospitable. I mean, when it comes to sports, no one does like Indiana. After that, we're suspect. If you want to find pretty women, you go to Chicago. You want to find uh, you know civil rights being treated equal, good luck. I mean, but Indiana is good for sports. Nice. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. And, that's, and and we make the best meth in America. I mean, if you. If you <laughs> If you want to be addicted and don't want your teeth anymore, you come to Indiana. We will. <laughs> we have some of the best. If you ever watch First Forty Eight or, or or Dateline NBC, let me tell you something. The best. We have the best. <laughs> Sports and meth. Sports and meth. <laughs> meth and Wait, <laughs> when can I come over? <laughs> <laughs> Got to get myself through this season somehow. Twenty one races. Twenty. <laughs> hey, let me tell you something, man. You come here first, and then you go to Austin, and you'll be ready for Austin if you come here first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. I was at Indianapolis in 2015, I think, and uh, it was it was nice. Yeah, I enjoyed I it. The, Great the, weekend. The, they uh, what they do is they change the, the names of the roads to like you know it was Marquez Way or Rossi Boulevard. I mean, we change the names of the towns. I mean, of the, the streets to the name of the racers. You can't beat that. No place in America does sports like Indianapolis. Like I say, anything else suspect. But after, but when it comes to sports, we do sports. <laughs> Trust me when I say that, man. Okay, By the way, interesting. a twenty-one race sitting. I'm gonna ask you about that. If if Mir was burnt out on the season he had when he won, what's twenty-one races gonna do to this guy? Like, I remember Marquez talking about that, like going, you know, we're gonna have to eliminate a race here or there because 
That's asking a lot. I mean, I think, and that, is F1 going 25? Oh, really? 25? I think no. it was 22 or 23, okay, maybe. Okay, 22, 23, but still, I mean, yeah. that's still a lot with the travel involved <laughs> and, uh, and how you guys operate. I mean, what has to be done? I mean, is, it, is there any such thing as, as too much of a good thing? Let's put it that way. I think so, yeah. I think 18, we had 18 races for a decade or something, and that was on the limit, I would say, of, of what or how many races there should be. 21... And maybe you get the impression that that might expand in the future to 22, oh. um, maybe more. I don't know. It, it just seems a bit crazy to me. Um, and especially when a lot of the countries and cities that are trying to join the calendar are far flung. I mean, it's a global series and therefore it should be recognized with the global calendar. And I agree with that. However, you know, the trips to Argentina, they're, they're big trips, man. You know, they're 30 hours or 35 hours. And it's not always the most enjoyable thing but you know look there's it's a great job and it's a fun environment to be in but the i would say that's one of the drawbacks yeah because i mean how how are you supposed to bring up a family when you're away 21 weekends probably more than 21 weekends a year you know what i mean because you got to i mean when you come back from the travel then you got to train i mean it's still a job and you like you said if you have a family good luck with that if you have kids you're going to miss some birthdays you're going to miss you're going to miss them growing up basically so it's going to be hard on the mechanics i think because the racers are relatively young most of them relatively young and with the exception of a couple they don't really have kids so but it's just the mechanics it's the older people in the group it's, it's going to be tough even if you bring your family to it's just going to be tough to keep them together all that traveling yeah, man. Yeah, because you're not just going to races. You have to be away traveling. You have to maybe go to the factory to build the bikes. And it's a it's an absurd amount of time away from home. It really is. Yeah. And, you know, if you're a rider and you're a good rider, you're getting paid a million euros a year or maybe more. And I work 21 weekends a year for that amount of money. Absolutely. But, uh, you know, if you're on a more modest salary, then it's, um, you know, the payoff isn't quite so obvious. Um, I would say so. Yeah, I, I would say 18 is the ideal amount, and 21, man, that's just uh, pushing the envelope a bit too far. Well, if you break it down, and it's like anybody says, you know, if you're doing your passion for what, if you, if you know, if you're doing what you love to do, which is ride motorcycles for a living, that's great. And but then, you know, there is a limit to everything. I like pizza, or I used to. I'm now getting fat, but I, when I used to like <laughs> pizza, it was great. But I didn't want it every day. Or no matter what it is, I don't like it every day. Well, I will take this. I will say this. I had I've had pad thai during the pe- pe- pandemic from this place called Noodles and Company. I literally had it every day for like fourteen days straight and never got tired of it. <laughs> so other than pad thai, I think I mean there's it, there's, <laughs> there's things it's too much of a good thing. And I think <laughs> will it transfer to the track? You think we think riders will be fatigued and maybe they'll make mistakes. I mean I mean when it's time when it's showtime, yeah, you're like okay, it's time to race, but Everybody gets tired, and it's a race weekend, and you got to, you know, okay, you traveled all the way to Australia. You're a little tired. You've had media. Race day comes, and you're just uh, exhausted, and it's maybe the 19th round. Like, okay, I got to get up. Is there going to be fatigue? Is there going to be riders crashing because they're tired mentally? I mean, yeah, there could be. Um, I think, you know, especially in, like, free practice sessions. Yeah, there's definitely a mental fatigue that builds up towards the end of the year. Absolutely. Um, I think that could be that could be a problem. Yeah, man, it's uh, it's a worry, I would say. Um, but look, these guys are professionals. They're athletes of uh, the highest degree at the highest level, so they're they're fit enough to do this kind of thing. But um, yeah, my uh, my worries are more with the uh, the journalist and uh, commentary uh, community at this uh, present moment, not necessarily the writers. How are the poor journalists going to survive these uh, trying times when they're away from home 20, 21 weekends a year? <laughs> Think of the journalist, BT. <laughs> it's all about the journalist. Neil, you are sneaky funny. If you were a boxer, you'd be like, oh, that one hurt. Oh, that one hurt. You don't see him coming. And next thing you know, that was funny. I'm telling you, man, you're sneaky. <laughs> Now what's the what's the what's the uh, on the other ca- on the calendar? What other uh, places won a MotoGP race that we haven't heard about? Well, um, I mean, obviously, the pandemic changed quite a few things, and um, you know, finances for certain places, certain countries um, might not be there anymore because of the the effects of the pandemic. But Mexico was uh, one of the the countries on the list. Brazil, I think, was another one as well. Oh. Indonesia has been talked about for a long time. Um, it's obviously on the calendar 
uh, next race, the second race of the year, two weeks time, they'll be there. So yeah, we, I remember hearing some stuff about Kazakhstan. So who knows, man? Um, yeah, there's, I think there are other countries that are, are looking to get involved. So let's see how it, let's see how it transforms. But you know, your, well, my, my ex colleague, you know, Steve Day, a man, a friend of the show, yes. a fantastic guy, great professional. I mean, yes. you know, Steve basically had to decide, I think I want to spend more time with my family and had to leave this behind. And as a consequence of the calendar growing in the, the kind of the, the way that it is. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to talking to Lewis. I, I really am. Seems like a great guy. Man, I just, I, you know, when you guys are running all the promos and everything and Steve's voice, I just, I just love Steve. Just, I mean, I love all you guys. This is a good group of guys. It's just, you're fun. You're great. It's just, I'm going to miss Steve. I'm sure I like Lewis, but man, I miss Steve. You know, he's a good guy. Yeah. Good guy. Steve's man. great, man. Steve's great. However, uh, well, actually, I was going to say, let's just uh, leave that. Thought. I don't want to reveal anything that maybe uh, hasn't been that Steve hasn't revealed yet. But um, let's say that um, if you're a fan of bike racing, you'll be able to hear Steve this year for sure. Oh, look at you yeah. dropping that nugget like a true journalist, like a true <laughs> journal. And yeah. I've heard, I've Plus, heard. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Plus Lewis, man. Lewis, Lewis knows his stuff. Super super well informed does his homework um yeah i think he's gonna be he's gonna be good man he's gonna be good and speaking of doing homework man i heard that you've changed your life in a sense of now that you've actually started booking in advance all the way up to what maybe finland now look at you what changed in you when you're taking i don't know what leadership changed. role you know what it's the new girlfriend isn't it um i guess so and <laughs> uh, it's probably just an accumulation of bad experiences when I've just been left thinking, why did I pay like that extortionate hotel price? Oh yeah, it's because you're a stupid idiot that didn't book your hotel a month in advance. You booked it three days in advance. You know, I had a few, too many of those experiences in the last year. Um, so, uh, I mean, having extra money at the end of the year is nice, right? You know, <laughs> rather than just like spunking it all on stupid hotels that maybe aren't even that nice. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, that, I think that's really what it was. Also, you know, the continual ribbing of my colleagues and uh, well, that, that also had an effect. Well, I bet I, got you, I, I bet I got you former beat. Former bullion. Look, I bet I got you beat. I, when I, when, during the Aston race, I actually stayed about eight miles from uh, uh, the, the airport in Amsterdam. So I, it was, yeah. <laughs> That's like two hours from the track, man. Yeah, yeah, I know. I had to wake up at four in the morning. I literally had to wake up at 4.30 in the morning to get there around seven or eight because traffic and everything. But yeah, because I thought, how big can this country be? I swear to God, I how that go. How big can this country be? So when I get off, when I get off yeah, the plane, like... I, I, I hand my passport to you know to the guys and they go, they go, what are you here for? I go, um, hey, I'm going to Aston. And, and I knew I was in trouble because they both went, What's that? And I go, oh God. And they go, oh yeah, it's a racetrack. And they go, and they go, oh. And, and they handed my passport back. I go, uh oh. And it was two and a half hours away. I literally had to get up at four thirty in the morning. I know on race day I had to get up at four in the morning because you know the traffic. But I had to get up at four thirty in the morning to make it to the track by seven thirty or eight. Yeah. So that was not, yeah, not smart. The big mistake that you made there is that you didn't get up at four twenty in the morning in the Netherlands. Say hey. Yeah. That's where it all went wrong, my friend. That's the magic R. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do that. I don't do that. I've never done that. Oh, no, nor do I. No, yeah, no. We, people always think because uh, I always talk about cocaine a lot, but I've never done any drug. I've never done any drug. I'm like, I'm like, if you would look at me uh, on paper and how I match on paper, I look like I'm a conservative Republican on paper. I hardly ever drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I hardly ever drink. I, I, my, my, my producer's going, you should be a Republican. But I hardly ever drink. I hardly, I've never really done drugs. I'm, uh, I am I look at stuff now like, ugh, that looks, that looks disgusting. And I mean, it's like, you know, like, I, 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 on paper it looks that way, but I'd be like, oh, I'll never be that way. But still, yeah, so I'm kind of conservative and didn't even know it. I go, really? I mean, I go, like, some stuff now doesn't even sound good to me like now. You know, like, I don't know. Like, sometimes I think, it, like, I watch something. Uh, it's like, it's like, 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 I pass a strip club when I go home. And I go, ugh, why are they spending their money in there? And I just keep on driving by. <laughs> I go, ugh. I literally go, ugh. And I just keep on driving. Isn't that weird? I've changed, man, big time. I don't know what it is. I don't know what got into it. And I'm not even, and I'm not even religious either, so I can't say I found the Lord. I mean, I just, I go, eh, that, that's disgusting. And I just keep going home. Uh, it's weird, man. 
Yeah, it's funny how you evolve uh, as your life goes on. I don't know about evolving, yeah. but I, I've changed. I don't know about evolving. <laughs> 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 I, I was like trying to put a positive spin on it, man. Yeah. <laughs> you go. But you know what? I always keep, honestly, but what always keeps me is like, I swear it's weird, but my love for GP just keeps going stronger every year. And it's the weirdest thing to say, but now every year, it's like I feel like I'm more, like now, I like it started out with just GP. And then when I got the video pass, it was like, okay, I can watch this and that. Then it got to be like, okay, I'm going to watch FP1. Then it's like, I'm going to watch FP1 and Moto3. I'm going to watch FP. And now it's like, I watch everything now. And I have circles under my eyes come Sunday. Because we have to get up at the crack of dawn to watch the races where you, it, it, the people in, in the UK bitch about having to get up early when they watch an American race. They go, oh, really? I do that all year long. I have no <laughs> idea what it's like. So, yeah, man, it's just my love for the sport grows more and more. And I swear to God, I've seen this sport. And I don't know everything like you know, you know, from being inside. But tell me, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't Pedro Acosta remind you mentally of a young Mark Marquez? It does, just a little bit, absolutely. Um, I was, yeah, I mean, I think the kid's got everything. I think he's got absolutely everything. He's got attitude, cockiness, abundance of natural talent, the right people around him, the right sort of family environment. Um, and just the right level of arrogance to think, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to do this. There's no doubt that I'm going to do this. Just the way he walks around the paddock and carries himself is, is incredibly impressive. And speaking to some people that were at the recent Model 2 test in Portugal um, that precede the first round of the season here in Qatar, uh, they're just saying like, yeah, I mean, of course this was going to happen. Apparently he's been... Uh, you know, there's rumors that he's been riding 600 machinery since he was 14. So it's not maybe that big a surprise that he's so comfortable aboard a Triumph 765 Model 2 machine when he's sort of used to super sport-esque machinery from the, the crazy young age of 14 years old. Um, yeah, it's it's mad. It, it's crazy, like just how, how fast he is. And I, I was, I don't know if, if you do the same thing, but occasionally just before the season starts, I check the odds just because sometimes it's an indicator of, okay, who is going to be stronger? Who's the favorite? Mm -hmm. He's the favorite for Model 2 this year to win the championship. And it's like Wait, the kid is 17. And he's had, yeah, and he's had one year in the world championship. He's a rookie in Model 2. He's 17 years old and he's the favorite. Like, how insane is that? It, it, it does sound insane, but unless you look <laughs> at, and, I, and I, I can't say that I'm, you know, I see things that other people don't, but it's like, I look at the mental. And I just remember, I knew Marquez was different when the camera was on him, but it was before FP1. And I can't remember if he was in already in GP or, or whatever, or it was in Moto2, but I just remember the camera, he was watching the screen and the camera came to him and it showed him it's sitting down and he found the remote and he changed the channel. And I was like, wow, that dude is so locked in mentally. And I just feel like Acosta is the same way. I feel like nothing rattles that kid. I remember him coming in after maybe a bad race or whatever. He'd come in, he'd sit with his people, he looked at the time, be like, like you know, oh, eh, it happens. And then he'd go back out there. And I mean, just, and that, what, man, the little things like that, that weekend, unfortunately, Bender messed it up, was when, you know, Faji was catching and Faji was having good weekends, good weekends. And it came down to like, oh, if Faji does it, this way he could take the lead. And when he got through it, at maybe it was FP, yeah, uh, no, the warm up, but was it warm up? Or, uh, yeah, warm up. It was warm up, yeah. And he goes, and he goes like this <laughs> to him. Remember, he waved at him. I mean, little things like that when you go, and at the time, he was, he's 16, and he goes like this to Faji, and I'm like, oh, this kid is ice fucking cold, man. I mean, you can't, the mental approach he has to the game, I think, per, I mean, precedes anything else he has. I mean, yeah, he has the great, he has a good body where he's gonna be, you know, skinny and, and whatever, but. It's that mental that you can't beat. And I think his yeah. mental, unless, and knock on wood, I hope, you know, everything goes wrong. Right, but unless something happens like, uh, you know, maybe bad crashes here and there, his mental game is going to be unravel and unraveled. And I can't wait. And I don't know how they're going to find a bike, but I would like <laughs> for him to win in Moto2. And I'd love for him to go to GP and have him and Mark just kind of like, it, it, it'd be like Rossi and Marquez, that torch being passed, and even though they don't want to pass it. And, Oh my God! Just the just the, the thought of Acosta and Marquez together racing. Holy! Does that just make you salivate? <laughs> yes, it does indeed. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 
just going to get a towel here and uh, wipe it <laughs> off my uh, wipe it off my lips if you don't mind. Just give me a second. <laughs> no, but I think some of the things that Acosta did last year, you looked at when Mark was in the the junior classes in Model well the Monty Fives and then the Model Two. He did things that were just fairly believable for a teenager, and uh, I think Acosta has done those kind of things where you think, nah, impossible, couldn't do it, like. Winning from pit lane um, in his second ever Grand Prix, that is just something that is ridiculous. Um, and I don't know, you just, I remember speaking to his team boss, Aki Ayo, last year. Aki was telling me about the race after he won in Doha, mm -hmm. where he came from pit lane. Yeah. And um, Aki said something like, um, you know, how's, how's, the, how's the last week been? I imagine there's been a lot of media attention. You know, has it been a bit crazy trying to stay on top of it all? And the cost just said, like, eh, not really. I mean, I changed my SIM card, deleted it Instagram, you know. Aki was like, I love that because it showed that he was focused on the right things. He knew that this kind of stuff was, it was going to divert his attention. And you think he's 16 and he has that foresight. Like, that is quite remarkable. I always, in these situations, think to what I was doing at 16 years old and, uh, <laughs> to say that I couldn't hold a candle to that type of behavior when I was 16, or even as a 34-year-old a adult, <laughs> uh, that would be understating the, the sentiment uh, to acquire a, a massive degree. So, <laughs> Well, think about, hey, I'm 20 years older than you. So I'd be like, I'm, I'm going, I mean, you could be my kid. And I would like, man, remember when you were 16? <laughs> <laughs> you could be my son, Neil. And I'd be like, yeah, yeah you were shit at 16. Look at this kid. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, mean, I, mean I always felt that you were the father that I never had. <laughs> but that sentiment, sentiment shared, man. <laughs> I do have a dad, by the way. He's, he's great. But <laughs> an American father. <laughs> how, be, how great would that be, an American black father? No one would believe us. We'd go out. Who's that? That's my dad. I mean, how great would that yeah. be? Wow. Big would be, would be who's that? Sitcom? Who's that big? Who's that big, tall, hairy, uh, indecipherable Irishman? Oh, he's my son. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. went shit at sixteen, but he finally got his life together. <laughs> God, I wish he was a little Pedro Acosta. <laughs> wish that was my son. <laughs> <I mean. laughs> Seriously, I think of Costa's. I think of Costa's main competition is going to come from his teammate. I think Augusta Fernandez is understated as a rider. I mean, I don't know what happened in the beginning of the season. Do you know where it was like in the beginning of the season where it was like it was like ah oh, he's not get the result, and then you know it boom, bit by bit the Augusta that that burst up on the scene start, finally start coming around. Do you know what happened in the beginning of the season where he really wasn't getting the results? Last year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it was, um, I think Augusto, he challenged for the title in 19 with uh, Cito Ponce's team. Yeah. Then he moved to Mark VDS in yes. kind of controversial circumstances because their lead rider, Alex Marquez, was supposed to go up, well, was supposed to stay with them, but he eventually went up to MotoGP because right. the rents were retired. Augusto went there and I think he just thought, this is it. This is the year where everything goes. And he, he basically just didn't really merge with the team immediately. And he got his ass handed to him, I think, by his teammate Sam Lowe's at the time. And that maybe just was playing on his mind. At the start of last year, he was flailing around, trying different setups. I remember at Qatar a year ago, he was literally changing the chassis, like from the current Calic chassis to the year old Calic chassis between sessions. And you just think, man, if you're doing that during a weekend, you are lost, totally lost. He changed his crew chief as well, I think, in that time. Um, so, yeah, I think just like a lot of factors, it just didn't quite knit together like he maybe expected it to. But I agree with you. By mid-season last year, he had certainly refined his mojo. And I think it's testament to Aki Ayo's team in Moto2 that the two guys that were first and second had dominated last year's championship have gone up to MotoGP. And it looks as though Aki's team again is going to maybe do the same this year with Augusto and, and Acosta. I think Aaron Kinnett is going to have a big say in the championship as well this year. But um, you have to say that Augusto and, and Pedro are going to be major players in the championship. Aki Ayo is the Bill Belichick, <laughs> I think, of that of that paddock, at least in Moto2. I mean, Aki Ayo, man, his, he's had his hand in all almost all the champions. Uh, the, uh, he, a little bit of Mark Marquez in the very beginning, uh, if I'm uh, wrong, if I'm not wrong. Nope, yeah, you're right, yeah. Mark Marquez, I mean... 
Everybody, but Brad Brad Bender was a beast in Mono Three. <laughs> I mean, seriously, even in, even in Mono right. Two, he could have had a chance to uh, take it from Alex that one year. I, I thought, I really thought, I don't, I don't know what what the circumstances <laughs> were, but if you'd have gave him another couple races, man, and 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 a little better result, I think he would have won that championship. I mean, Aki Io is just incredible. He said he just lets the riders be themselves, and it's just that cool kind of fi- uh, is he, he's Finnish, right? That cool yep. kind of finish, kind of like. Okay, we just you know I don't know their ways. I'm I'm going there this year. Hopefully, knock on wood, and I'll see what their ways are like. But yeah, he's just that cool kind of you know like un, just unshakable kind of like kind of like Valerie Botas, but you know, <laughs> but <laughs> maybe a little bit better. And I don't mean to knock on <laughs> Botas, but you know, you know what I'm trying to say. You know, get that, yeah, that yeah. cool kind of that that cool quiet intensity. Exactly. Never let the Never let the good times get too good. Never let the bad times get too bad. Just it's remain so constant good. and keep working. Yeah, remain very level. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't really have much to add. He's, he's just a, a, a top professional. He has that team all pulling in the same direction, even when two of the riders are fighting for the championship. And in most circumstances, that would become a very fraught, uh, difficult situation to manage. And I'm sure there were moments last year when it was difficult, but it never really gave the impression of it being difficult. And I think that's testament to to Aki's methods, to the kind of philosophy that he uh, instills in his riders from the very start. It's like the team, I mean, it sounds a bit cliched, I suppose, but, you know, the team is the is a big thing and your personal ambition should not get ahead of the fact that we are in this together. Um, you certainly saw that with uh, Raul Fernandez and Remy Gardner last year when they were fighting for the championship. So, yeah, he's he's got that. And it's not just, this is something that he's been kind of imbuing within his technicians and his his is mechanics for a decade you know this is a, a long term thing that he's been working on so um yeah he's he's got it nailed man he's, he's really yeah i mean that is the team to be in in moto 2 at the moment well what, what do you know anything about the controversy that after the season was over when raul said they wanted <laughs> remy to win and that kind of and because there was a con and i don't know if it was you that told me this but it was kind of a rumor that Raul really didn't want to go to MotoGP. Like he didn't want to go up, or I don't even want to go up with that team. I think he wanted to go to Yamaha. I don't know the exact circuit. Maybe you know to fill me in more. But what was that controversy about when he kind of said that, like, hey, they they wanted Remy to win? It was weird, man. <clears throat> you got the impression right the way through last year that Raul really wasn't content with KTM's decision to put him in MotoGP, even though he signed a contract to go to MotoGP with them. Mm -hmm. um, He was always adamant that he wanted to stay in Moto2 for another year, which would be this year in 2022. Um, But the fact that he was getting so much interest, I think from Aprilia and from Yamaha, as you said, um, KTM were like, look, we don't lose you. Stay with us. We'll put you in MotoGP. But the kind of the more the season went on, Yamaha just wouldn't go away, it seemed. And they almost you got the impression that they felt like, hey, we should keep going here. And uh, I would say Raul was kind of batting his eyelids in that direction quite often, much in the way that you're batting your eyelids at me right now, <laughs> uh, B2. And, uh, and I honestly have the impression that that is not going to be a relationship that lasts longer than this year. You know, I, I see Raul getting out of KTM at the end of uh, 2022. Um, he's the kind of guy that has that... Lorenzo-esque self-belief, the way he carries himself, that he's like, you know what? I sh- even though I'm a rookie, I should probably be fighting for the top six at the moment. And I don't see, I don't think he's there at the moment with the KTM just because it's still quite an inconsistent package. Um, and basically to get back to your question, that little tiff that he had after he lost the championship, I think that was a, a combination of his frustration with KTM that um, he was basically going to MotoGP with them, which he didn't really want to do. Ideally, he would have been doing it with Yamaha. And also the fact that he lost the championship. Like, I mean, obviously, you just as a, an elite performer, elite rider, cannot believe that you lost it <clears throat> based on merit. It has to be maybe some outside influence that influenced that. Well, to me, it was a couple. <clears throat> For one, okay, that was Yamaha. And it's almost like they went back on what they were talking about. Because, uh, <clears throat> you know... They didn't really want Rossi in the beginning, that team. And they really didn't. And it was like, they kind of did him a favor. I think that's why they drugged. They feel like, all right, we'll take him. But they didn't want to be the team that goes, no, we don't want Rossi. And then what did they do? They signed another old rider with uh, Divisioso. I mean, no offense to Dovey. Love him. But let's be honest here. When you got a talent like Raul Fernandez coming up, I mean, this guy, I mean, he's, he's on, he's the guy that, want, no, I think I, I always say this. I said, hey, 
Remy deserved that championship. Remy earned that championship. No, no disrespect at all to Remy, but every time a race is over, there was something about Raul. There was something about Raul. Remy might win. Something about Raul. Remy wins. Something about Raul. Raul wins, bro. I mean, it was something about Raul was the one you had your eyes on. Remy may have won it, but Raul was one. He go, God damn, this Raul kid. And he, he, I'm gonna get wrong. He screwed himself. Was it was it Mazzano or was it Aragon? Where he yeah. had the lead and he crashed. That big crash he had. Mazzano. Yeah, that, so I mean, he bought that on himself. He really did. I, 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 never, I never really did find out what happened in that crash. That was so deep. What happened there? Do you know? Do you remember? Uh, it, was a, it was a weird weekend. That was the second Mizano race. We had rain basically all Friday, all Saturday. Dunlop had brought a different tire allocation than the previous Mizano race weekend. Everyone went with the softer option, which wasn't available at the previous race. And because of the weather over the free practice sessions, um, no one had really spent a lot of time using this tire. So Raul's an experience basically told because he was on a tire that was kind of in, untested in that certain, in that circumstance, mm -hmm. in those conditions on the Sunday. And um, yeah, he, he basically crashed because of that. He, mean, he was on the he was on the limit and yeah, yeah. Well, well he was leading and he was I wanted him to win it only because you know I, I want to see a camp championship come down to the very end now I still say I still say the greatest championship I've ever seen come down to the winner take all was it I think it was 2015 when it was when it was Vinales Renz and um, Salom uh, Salom yes it was out of those three and it was winner take all and that last lap and that last turn. What Maverick did to Renz, man, I still it still just brings this goosebumps on the back of my neck. That race was incredible, and and uh, Folger was in the middle of it all. Jonas was like, I can't get out of this, but I want to. I don't want to be, you know, screw one of these guys. And, and he ended up kind of think, getting out of the way a little bit. But man, that was one of the greatest races ever, winner take all. And I really think Raúl, as much talent as Raúl has, I think, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, his weakness, at least for me, and I, I'm just talking on my ass, I think not winning a championship, and you know, like, it, it took him a while to get really, really, really going in, in Moto3, maybe because he was taller or whatever, but toward the end, he was a monster, and then in Moto2, man, he was a beast toward, you saw what he did in Moto2, but he's never won that championship, and to me, <laughs> and now he's never won a championship, and now he's going to the MotoGP without ever winning a championship, I mean, there's something to be said about that, or is there? You know, you're closer to me. Is there something to be said about never winning a championship and now you're into the pr pr premier class? I don't know. I think it, it could be something that maybe nags away at you and causes you to lose focus, makes you bitter and angry. But in Raul's circumstances, what he did last year in Moto 2 was something that never, no one had ever done in a, a Moto 2 or before that 250cc championship as a rookie. He won eight races. I mean, there are some sensational riders that have come through that category in history. None of them had ever won more than seven races in their rookie year. So I think that says a lot about just how good Raul is. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say that because he's not a champion, it will it'll hold him back in the future. Maybe it'll make him more hungry, you know. Um, uh, I'm not too sure. But, yeah, he was certainly pissed that he lost that. Um, as well he should have know. been. No, as well yeah. he should have been. And, I mean, personally, I think Mono 2... The greatest racers to come out of Moto Two were Marquez and Spargo. To me, they come out of Moto Two, and and the, the one that was like ah oh, was Redding when Redding didn't win in Moto Two, which I thought he had it. That one, that one hurt me when he didn't win that. I thought he had it, and um, I think it was over in Motegi, was it? I know he crashed in Phillip Island, but I think it was Motegi that kind of pretty much sealed the deal, didn't it? Right. I think it was someone crashed in front of him, and then he hit the the bike on the ground, and yeah. He was already riding there with a broken wrist that he sustained the previous week at, in Phillip Island. So, yep. yeah, man. And, and just... I think Dominic Agurda was in that crash. That was one of the men. I, I, that one, I really felt bad for Scott because I thought he had it. And then it just kind of, you know, unraveled. And that's a hard thing to watch, man. Because, you know, I want all those guys to do well. You know what I mean? I really do. And I, because they're, you know, they're living the dream that we, you know, if we, if you, you know, people like you at 16, if you would have had your shit together, and people like myself, well, I, you know, I'm <laughs> focused, we could have. Stop, re stop reminding me, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> We would have been more focused. That's why those kids, they're living the dream. So it's kind of hard to like, 
you know, even though it's all in good fun and ribbon, like I kind of hate now. I kind of hate dogging. I don't dog them, but I kind of hate making fun of them because, man, they're going for their their dream. They're you know, they're this is what they're working for it, their whole lives, and you know, they're dieting. They're doing what they like. Uh, Brandon Posh told me he's always hungry. You know what I mean? Because they have to you know, a certain yeah. way to raise. So they're doing all this. So it's like, man, I want them all to do well to make that sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice. I mean, oh, that, that's why it hurts to watch something like that happens. You know. Yeah, and it comes back to what we were saying earlier in this conversation about that commitment and that relentlessness that with your training, with your diet, physical preparation, it doesn't always come across as the most fun lifestyle, you know, away from the track that is. You know, obviously there's lots of glamour and competing is in this sport is, is super cool. But um, yeah, man, some of the commitments and the sacrifices that you have to make are gnarly, I think I would say, to use one of your... Americanisms, yeah, <laughs> gnarly. <laughs> gnarly. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. Oh, I want to know what riders have you pissed off? I know you told me the Jack Miller story, but name another rider <laughs> you pissed off. Uh, how long have you got, BT? <laughs> I want to hear. I want to hear. Um, I'm trying to think. I recently, you know, whenever I was, um, I used to work for a website, and that was like a a daily news site. Yeah. And. Uh, now, when I write, it's, it's mostly for magazines. Mm -hmm. And I don't think writers maybe have access or, or maybe don't look at the magazines as immediately as they would, you know, website story. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe I have, but I don't get the impression that over the last year or two years, I've, I've particularly pissed off anyone or, or made enemies with anyone. I, I, you know, I could be wrong. There could be a lot of guys listening to this being like, oh yeah, well, that time you did this to me, you prick, like, you know, I don't know. Maybe I did, but um, yeah, if I told you about the Jack Miller thing, that, that was obviously one of them, yeah, back in the day. That was the greatest. Um, I mean, that was the greatest. I love that one. I still think about that. And laugh. Every time I see Miller, I just laugh, you know? <laughs> yeah, he was well within his rights to do that as well, you know? And I kind of look back at that and think like, yeah, that was, I didn't handle that very well. <laughs> I think it was something you were talking about Rossi too, I think. I think you maybe a misquote with Rossi on, on a... He thinks Marquez is probably going to break his record, maybe, or whatever. It was something that misquote. You had to correct it. Right, yeah, yeah. Maybe there was something like that. It was lost in translation. Yeah, it was lost yeah. in translation. Yeah. Do you, do you piss Rossi off? I don't know, man. That's not something that stands out in my mind. Again, I could just be like uh, sort of <laughs> lackadaisically walking through life thinking everything's fine and dandy and everyone's like, he's a prick. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but Rossi, I, maybe I did. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, not to my knowledge that I've I've pissed the great man off to be honest <laughs> <laughs> okay well here we go we're going to quick fire I'm, I didn't borrow that phrase but your, top, your winners of the championship this year in Moto GP Moto 3 and Moto 2 okay, Moto 3 I think is easy Dennis Foggy I think is going to win that comfortably who's, who's going to give him, who's going to give him the, uh, the, the stiffest competition uh, I mean, I think Sergio Garcia, but a lot of people who know a lot about the sport are saying Sergio Garcia's teammate, Izan Guevara. Izan um, Guevara is a watch. beast. I like I like how he got mad last year in, in Austin uh, when he thought he didn't win it, and then he finally you know, he won. I like how mad he got. Like, I like this kid. But, man, Sergio Garcia, I just love that kid. I love him. And also, you know who I like? I don't, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe he had it together. But Xavier Artigas, I like Xavier. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like I like Chavi as well. And I think finally Sasaki's gonna do well. I think. I hope, man. I hope because that is one kid that had a rough year last year. Yeah. You know, he had a he had a tough time, man. Um, did you did you have him on the show one time? Yes, I had him and Maria. Yeah. On the show. It was great. He's a funny dude too. Once you get him going, he's a funny kid, man. I like. He's a him. character. Yeah, yeah, I like that kid a lot. Now, yeah. and you know what? I was in a cafe in Barcelona like last week, just having a, a coffee and I was doing some work and there was a, a girl, um, I guess she was like in her early 20s, who was wearing a, a, a helmet which had Crazy Boy written on it. And I was like, hey, Ayuma is, uh, you know, his kind of, his rep is growing here. This is kind of cool. That's awesome. I think it's right? great, man. Well, you can't help but like that kid, man. He's a yeah, good kid, yeah. you know? He's, He's cool, kid. yeah. So, yeah, I'd say Foggia Model 3, I'd say... Augusto Fernandez in Model 2, just because I think experience is maybe going to win out. And uh, Model GP, I'm going to have to say Mark, man. It's just Mark. Everything that's been coming out of Mark during the preseason points to him just having a, a fantastic season. 
He just seems he's he seems even more business like. Like I watch him in the press conferences, <coughs> and he seems like he just didn't really want to be there. He's more serious. He's like, he's almost. And to, to, did you see the answer he gave today when they asked about <laughs> what, what, Rossi? He shot all over him. Oh, I was From like, a great oh, height. man, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, hey, you know, he wasn't he hadn't been a competitive, so we're not really gonna miss him. Basically, <laughs> basically, that's what he said. Yeah, I, like, I believe that's what the what the kids call a, a sick burn, bro. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was uh, quite something. I mean, that guy knows how to guy knows how to throw a fist in a kind of barrage of words in a very succinct way. Well, Chapeau. Yeah. Well, you know what? Here's what I think happened. I think he really tried to be friends after that debacle. Into I think he really tried to bury the hatchet, bury the hatchet. And I think when he finally saw Rossi, he was like, no. I think at some point he just goes, you know what? Fuck it. And he just goes, all right, I'm done. I'm done trying to be right. nice. Because at one time, it was in qualifying. I think it was maybe Mazzano was qualifying. Remember, they almost ran into each other. And it was no fault. They were just one of those things where they happened to come together. And he went like this. And then he, when he had the press conference, he goes, just for clarification, I wasn't saying I, I, I didn't apologize. Remember that? He made it. He goes, I just want, just for everybody to know, I wasn't apologizing. When he, when he went like this, I was like, whoa, ho, ho, things have changed. And I, they, they will never be friends. They will, on their deathbed, they'll be like Trump and McCain. You know, McCain was on the deathbed. He goes, whatever you do, don't let Trump come to my funeral. Flatline. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean you got to hate yeah. somebody to say, don't come to my funeral. <laughs> You know, yeah. Are you um, are you a Sopranos fan? Did you ever watch The Sopranos? A that TV episodes. show. Yeah, yeah. There's a really good like sort of nemesis in The Sopranos, and there's a, a scene it on before it builds onto this kind of violent crescendo, where the nemesis is just like quietly like lying in bed, and is like he's sleeping next to his wife. His wife's fast asleep, and he's just like lying there. And there's like a, it's just a a minute long scene, and he's just like in his bed, middle of the night, staring at the ceiling, and he's kind of just going over things and that just reminds me like i bet you when rossi's an old man he'll be sitting in his bed at night thinking about sepang 2015 just thinking that little shit i i i foresee rossi growing old like that yeah i mean i th things like that if you've done that if you've done sports and you can't go back and at one moment you wish you could you never it never gets out of your system man i mean you could tell the way he he smiles and everything. It's weird, but you just see that it, that never leaves you and it never really left him. I, I just remember yeah. when the season started again in 2016, he and Lorenzo were sitting on those bikes and he was anywhere but there. And I remember a Gabri uh, his, his, his crew chief that year, after that year was over, he goes, yeah, you know, sometimes we were talking and you would just look at him, you go, you knew he wasn't even there. I mean, <laughs> I, I just think that took I think that took the life out of him because I was like, I was going, this is his run. I go, if he doesn't make it this time, it's over. And even Stoner talked about it on the Gypsy Tales podcast, how, you know, it worked on those guys before. But, you know, that new generation coming in like Stoner, you know, Stoner said it didn't really work on him. But eh. but when we came to Mark, you, like I said, I said before I say it again, mentally strong athletes. I think Michael Jordan and then I think Mark Marquez. And unfortunately, he's in motorsports, and they won't give him the credit he deserves. But his mental, you, I mean, Rossi to play those old games, they weren't going to work on Mark. And he, yeah. he, and he, he pulled the, the Tiger's tail, and, you know, we all saw what happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, great, the great miscalculation of his career. Yeah, man. Now, but it's also, we can go in, oh, my God. I mean, I know I got to go, but we can get in the long. But for one, <laughs> he, shouldn't have, he shouldn't have been on Lorenzo's, Lorenzo's, uh, when Lorenzo, on, in Mazzano, Lorenzo was on a fast lap, and Rossi was in his way. Remember, so he—that's right. where he's in. He had to go to the back of the uh, the grid in in, uh, in Valencia because of that. Well, yeah, he got yeah he got one penalty point from that. This was like an old system that they had in MotoGP back then, where I think if you got four penalty points, you had to start the race from the back of the grid. And uh, yeah, he got one for that incident in Mizano that you just described, and then obviously the three for the the Sepan clash hashtag. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. And then, and he wanted to blame Marquez in, in, uh, in Australia, but Hey, it was Ian Oni that one that, 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 you know, that got the podium who was in your way. You can blame Marquez and say Marquez is doing whatever, but it was Ian Oni who took the points away from you. Also, it was your boy. So, I mean, 
it's not just one instance, but man, we can go to 2015 all day. We really could, but God damn it, Neil, <laughs> it's always good to talk to you, man. I, I gotta get ready to get out of here, man. Thank you for making it happen. I know you had to, I, you were having fun. It was almost like, you know what? I feel like it was like your dad going, hey, you gotta be home by 10. You're like, guys, I gotta go. My dad wants to talk to me. That's what I feel like now, because you were having a good time and yeah, you he hit me up going, hey, man, I'm getting dropped off my hotel right now. I'll be up in seven minutes. Said, okay, so I feel bad that I stopped your Don't feel time. bad, man. Don't feel bad. Yeah, exactly. I was in that ca taxi on the way home thinking, I have to go and speak to my dad and he's going to berate me from my state at 16 years old and he's going to belittle me again in front of his global following. <laughs> <laughs> but no, BT, it's always a pleasure, man. I love, I love uh, speaking to you. Your enthusiasm is infectious and uh, yeah, man, thanks for having me on again. Oh my, seriously, man, you're always one of my favorite people in the world. I mean it from the bottom of my heart. You're funny. You're just a good dude, a good chat. Love it. I'll see you in Austin, knock on wood, and hopefully we'll hang out Sweet together man. in Finland, knock on wood, man. So thank you so Finland. much, Neil. I'll see you in a couple hours. I'll listen to you in a couple hours on the broadcast. <laughs> I can't wait for the season to start, bro. It's going to be great. So, hey, real quick, who's going to win? The winner of MotoGP in Qatar? Eka Okay. Uh, and uh, how about in uh, Moto2? Uh, Aaron Kinnett. Moto3? Dennis Fodger. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be watching, man. Thank you so much, Neil. I appreciate it. Check out Neil on on uh, off road on track. On track, off road. On track, off road. Digital magazine. Check him out there. You can read his column, or you can listen to him on the Paddock Pass podcast. Correct. Yes, and that's that right. is a great. That is a fun podcast. Listen to those guys. They make you laugh. They're fun. I'm BT saying thank you so much for listening. I appreciate you. And like I say about this time, you know the word. Pay.